everyone, I'm, I'm back and I'm back today with a video for you, a, a, a video demonstration for you. And we have been talking this past month about plein air painting, the importance of plein air painting, tips for plein air painting, approaches to plein air painting, and then uh, hopefully you've gotten a chance to get out there and try it for yourself or at least look out your window and that you've gotten some good tips. But then comes the question of what do you do with all those plein air paintings that you do? Now, if you've been following me, you know that I usually just treat them as studies, right? So that they're not supposed to be paintings I'm going to put in a frame, although sometimes I end up liking them. Uh, but that's not the goal. The goal is just to take notes with them and then uh, just like a notebook or a sketchbook, you put them on the shelf until you need to review your notes. And that's what I do with the plein air paintings. So when I'm done with a plein air trip, what do I do with the paintings? I'm going to just step off to show you a couple of things. I'm going to put those here. I usually just keep them in the book, in these portfolio books. This is where I store my paint, my paper. I don't have any in here. This is ready to go on another trip. So here's some paper ready to go. But after I'm done painting, I just keep the studies in there and label it. These are inexpensive. I think uh, I got two 5 by 7 on Amazon for about seven bucks, eight bucks. So, you know, if you don't, you can fill these up and keep them as if they were your sketchbooks. If you have a whole bunch of plein air paintings, then another thing that I do with them is I just make little paper envelopes and I label it. These are studies that I did from in 2013 and 2014 all southwest. And I basically just put them in there and I, and I stick um, glassine paper or or newsprint paper in between each painting. And that's when you have, there's a lot, there's a lot of paintings in here. And uh, the other day someone was interested in one, I was able to pull the file and started to go through them and I was like, oh, I love these studies. I think I'm gonna use some of these to paint studio paintings. And that's really one of the things I love to do with plein air paintings is take one out in the studio and use it as inspiration for a painting. So that's what I wanna demonstrate for you today. And this is the study that I'm working with. Let me just hold it here so you can get a look at it. This was done in uh, southern New Jersey, a uh, marshy area. I know it could be any marshy area, right? Um, and, I, and I like this study because I like the colors. These are the colors that I actually saw in real life. So, if, you know, I'd painted a photo, it probably wouldn't have as much color, right? Because, you know, a lot of times the camera doesn't capture those subtle nuances that we can see with our eye. So I'm going to take this little study and use it instead of a photograph to paint a studio painting. So the first thing that I'm going to do is make some sort of plan. Now we've been talking a lot about doing thumbnails, making plans for our paintings, and so I always want to take a minute to do a plan and decide what I'm going to do. But today I'm going to show you a, a really quick way to do a plan by using a dry erase board. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make my plan on the dry erase board, but I want to talk about what I think I want to do for my studio painting. I think I am most drawn in this particular scene to the sky, but I didn't show very much of the sky. So I think what I'm going to do instead is lower the horizon and make this painting more about the sky and less about the, the foreground grassy area. So let me put this down, and I'll try to do it upside down. This little dry erase board I get at the Dollar Tree, so a dollar, it's a great little bargain. I use these all the time. So the first thing I do is I write why. Why am I painting this? What am I drawn to? What is exciting about this? And for me it's the drama in the sky, so I write drama in sky, just as a reminder. And then I'm going to do an 8x10 painting, um, horizontal landscape format. This is UART, uh, probably 400 grit, which is my favorite. And I'm going to go ahead and just draw my shape of my format so that I remember I wanted to lower the horizon. And I still really enjoy these different layers of trees. So I want to put in those layers. Uh, here. This is just a reminder for me. And I will have to put something on the foreground, but I'm going to make this kind of zigzag shape to remind me to make sure I pull the viewer in. And then it's really about the sky, so I'm not going to have to do much with that. So this is my very quick little study. You could 
go further and make it a value study if I wanted to. So what are going to be the darker areas? I'm going to just do it upside down and I'll show you. Those would be the upright planes, which of the trees. So I know that would be the dark. And then I'm going to just darken this foreground area so that I have a nice, dark, mysterious foreground. And that's my little value study. So you can see, you can do a very, very quick plan without taking a lot of time. That's it. That's my plan. The next part of my plan, though, is to choose my uh, pastels, my palette. And you know if you've been watching my videos that I usually take a tray, a butcher tray, go over to my box and pull a bunch of colors that I'm going to use for the painting. Sometimes, though, I want to uh, kind of challenge myself, I guess you could say. So I pick a box of pastels that are selected by another artist. This happens to be the Richard McKinley landscape set from Terry Ludwig pastels, which is one of my favorite of the Terry Ludwig sets. So I say to myself, you know what, let's see if you can just use these colors to paint your painting. I know that I'm going to have a lot of gold, so I'm going to supplement with the stunning yellow set. So I'm going to use these two sets. Why am I going to do that instead of choosing from my box? Just for fun, just for challenge. Now, I, I'm going to just address this question because I get this question all the time. How come um, I can't just keep my pastels in the original boxes? Why do you recommend that I put them in a big box? Um, and that is because you need to have a basic set of colors and values that are all together so that you can see them. So go ahead and pan over to my box, if you don't mind my uh, videographer there. It's a mess, excuse the mess, but what I want you to see is I have a very good selection of color and values that, that, that I can choose from. Once you get a good selection of color and value, then you can start to, if you get a new box of pastels, say, oh, you know, I'm just going to keep these in their box. But until you do that, you really need to take them out of the box. Once you get a good set, then it's fun and it's okay to say, okay, I want to keep all my darks, or I want to keep that special Diane Townsend, you know, um, iridescent set separate. That's fine. So I get that question all the time, so I wanted to address it. So I'm going to challenge myself by just using this set today. The first thing I'm going to do is transfer my little uh, thumbnail to my paper, and I'm just going to use a um, pencil, regular pencil. One thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to make my tree line probably a little bit smaller than I really want it to be, because it will grow. That's the one thing about when you're putting in trees or mountains, they tend to grow when you add the pastel. So I start off a little bit smaller than I really want to end up with. And that's just a, a good general rule of thumb. I want a little variety in the tops of the tree line. And then it's going to be about the clouds in the sky. That's really what the painting oops, is all about. <clears throat> so once I have those the drawing in place, the first thing I'm going to do is ask myself, how do I want to block this painting in? There's lots of different ways we can start a painting, lots of different starts. Um, one of my favorite ways is just to simply use one color family and four values. So uh, I could, for example, start off with uh, the color family of purple. So I'm going to block in the dark with a dark Oh, well, that's more of a red-violet. And, and then I would say, okay, I need to block in those middle value areas with a lighter value. So I pick a lighter value of purple. And then the sky, well, I've got clouds, so I'm going to start with one. That actually looks very similar. Which, let me see if I can find one that's a little bit lighter. That looks close, too. I'm going to do it anyway. I think I have one that's a little bit lighter in here. Here we go. There we go. Purples are funny things. They actually 
a lot of times look light, but they, when you use them, they are actually appear to be a little bit darker. I'm going to go ahead and put this distant tree line with blue, just because I know it's way in the distance and I want to make sure I get it to look like it's setting in the distance. I'm going to add a nice blue violet to the ground a little bit right here. Now the next thing I want to do is take my piece of pipe insulation foam. Don't worry about it. Pipe insulation foam, you've all seen it. I use it every painting. Can you see it now? Mm -hmm. Okay. And I'm going to blend in that very first layer with the pipe insulation foam. And if you've been following my demos, you can see that uh, this is one of my go-to methods for starting a painting. So <clears throat> if you're new to this page and you haven't seen a lot of my demos, I encourage you to go back and look at them because you'll see a pattern emerge. That no matter how I start a painting, I always want to start with a soft, mysterious, out-of-focus underpainting. And the pipe insulation foam allows that to happen. Alright, so now once I have one layer of color down, I basically have a value map. I can start in with my, with my other colors. And what I want to do is establish the trees so I know their shapes. And then I'm going to go ahead and paint the sky because the sky is what this painting is all about. So I have one layer of a, a warm color in the trees. I'm going to just go right ahead and put in some of the green. This is a cooler kind of blue-green. Um, where the light is coming from. I know that the light is coming from the left, so I'm going to make a little sun to remind me. It's not really a sunny day, it's got breaks in the cloud kind of day, but I know that there'll be some feeling of a lighter side on the, on these tree shapes. So I'm going to go ahead and add a lighter green, but that's too cool. So I'm going to go ahead and add a yellow green to those trees, just so that they don't look um, like they're too far back because they're not way in the distance. That's that's a little bit that, of a better choice. I liked how there was some little smaller trees kind of sticking out in the foreground area, so I added those in. Then the next layer is further back, so that means I need a lighter, cooler green. So I selected a very pale blue green. And when I take a, a photo and post the photo of the painting, uh, you'll be able to see these colors a little bit better. And so now I have one layer, and I have two layers, and then I have that very distant piece of land that I put in with a very uh, bright blue. I need to tone that down just a little bit. It's a little bit too um, sky blue. So I'm scumbling over a blue-green, and I think I want to put a little bit of gray down violet over that just to push it back a little bit more. But I left some of the blue showing so it really wasn't that it was a bad choice because um, sometimes you make these choices and then you cover them up but if you let some of the original choices show through it makes it more interesting. Now I've made little tiny marks of this purple uh, behind the second tree level of trees just so that I could create another layer that's that idea of linear perspective allowing us to stack things up and create depth. Um, now I can go ahead and paint the sky because I know where my trees are going to go. And I'm going to begin by just reinforcing some of those purples that I put in already. I am painting what I call a... Um, what do I call this? Energetic sky, meaning I'm going to put some of my marks, my colors down, and just kind of leave them alone. I'm not going to um, go over them. I'm not going to blend them out too much. I don't want them to be too soft and blended. I want them to. I want you to feel the energy that I felt in this sky as it was quickly changing from a stormy sky to a a brighter sky. Um, so this is when I, I call this an energetic sky when I just put marks down and leave them alone. 
And uh, we are going to be spending the month of June on painting the sky and clouds. So uh, I'm not going to talk too much about what I'm doing here with the sky because we're going to be covering it. But just this is a, an opportunity for you to observe how I go about painting what I call an energetic sky. Make a mark and leave it alone. I'm not blending it. So I want you to see the strokes. And I like how it was getting brighter and, and more uh, peachy kind of yellow as it went down to the horizon. It was pretty bright. And I'm using the sky colors now <clears throat> to start to carve into the tree shape. So I can use this color, this peachy sky color, as if it were a knife carving into the tree shapes just to make those tree, the uh, silhouette or the outline of the tree more interesting. Break it up some. This, the idea of creating air or sky holes. And a lot of times if I put a sky hole in, I'll tap it with my finger slightly so that I, it's not doesn't look like a, a blob or uh, sometimes they look like Christmas ornaments because you can just see dots in the sky. So I like to make a mark and kind of softly tap it. Make a mark and softly tap it. Also with sky holes, you want to make sure they're not all the same shape and size. So I want to vary the shape and the size. So I just added a little bit more purple to break up all of that. So that's all I'm going to do with the sky. That's what I consider an energetic sky. And to me it captures the, the emotion and the energy that I felt when I was looking out at this scene. Um, now I'm going to move on to the um, to the foreground area, and before I get to the very front, I'm going to start in the distant area, and that will allow me to remind myself to create that illusion or feeling of depth. I'm going to grab those um, stunning yellows. I was searching my mind for the name. They're called stunning yellows. And I'm going to use some of these yellows to start creating the, the land. And using the violets that are in the um, underpainting or the block-in to um, add a little bit of interest. So I'm using narrow horizontal bands of a duller yellow for the distant area. I don't want to use the brightest yellows I have for these distant areas. So I'm trying to use the, the duller and now I'm going to use like the light ochre kind of color. I'm going to use this color to start to break up... Um, where does this tree end? Right here. There we go. I want to make sure that I know where these levels of trees um, <clears throat> stop. There we go. Now remember I wanted to have kind of a zigzag pattern, so I want to go ahead and reinforce that. I'm going to take the dark out once again, and I'm going to just pull it down like kind of a Z shape, pulling us to the trees. And then once I have that in place, I can go ahead and start to add more of the yellow grasses. And I'm just basically taking these yellows out of the box and using them. As I get to the foreground, right in the front, I'm going to start to change my marks and go more of, a, uh, of an up and down or vertical. Um, and I'm going to just use the edge of the pastel to create a few pieces of grass. So the idea is a few pieces of grass lets our eye fill in the rest. We don't have to have um, every single blade of grass represented in our painting. I'm going to add a little bit of this nice orangey color just to add a little interest right here near the, the center of interest, which is the trees. And while it's in my hand, I'm going to just scumble a little bit over some of the, the uh, trees just to connect the what's on the grass to the tree shapes. And I think I need to use some of these yellows that I used in the ground up in the sky because I want there to be a nice connection between the colors on the ground and the colors in the sky. 
and because I'm using colors out of a different box, I, I'm going to go ahead, if I put a color in there, I'm going to put a little note of it in the sky, and that helps there to be a visual connection between the two. And the last thing I'm going to do is come in and add some hints of tree trunks. And I'm going to simply use the side of a grayed down gray, this is just a gray, and I'm going to just kind of very gently create a few linear marks in the tree so that you can see some of the suggestion of tree trunks. I can come over with a little bit of a darker color here and put some on this section. This little blob right here in the distance is too um, dark for back in the where it is. So I'm, I'm going to just take that blue green and get rid of it. And you can see already that it makes a huge difference and that little blob is not jumping forward anymore. So that's basically taking that plein air study, taking what I remembered from the day and translating it to a studio painting. And I'll probably spend just a few more minutes on it after we uh, hang up. Because uh, I really want to look at the things that I need to do to finish it, those finishing touches. And I'll share those with you in the comment section. So I hope you enjoyed this demo, plein air to studio.